Yeah, so I think most people who perhaps know a little bit about Karl Marx and his ideas have probably heard the famous quote, religion is the opium of the people. But I think far fewer probably have heard the full, uh, the full quote of that. So I thought I'd give it uh, in full just for everyone. So he says, religious suffering is at one and the same time the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. So what does this mean? Um, well, I've never tried opium uh, before, but I'm, I'm reliably informed that it has a kind of dual uh, effect on you. On the one hand, yes, it kind of dulls your, your uh, experience, your understanding of, of the real world, so it makes you less able to act uh, upon it. Um, but there's also another reason, perhaps, that people might uh, kind of resort to uh, opium. And one of the main uh, reasons for this, really, is because of very real suffering that they're experiencing in their lives, either physical uh, or mental. And so someone will turn to this drug as a way, basically, to comfort um, themselves. So Religion for Marxists is not just some uh, you know, nasty trick that's thought up by the ruling class in order to fool people and stop them uh, acting. Marxists would say that religion does play a real role in society and it has a material basis in the poverty, uh, in the suffering and the oppression that exists uh, in the world. Uh, and more than anything else, actually, we would say that it's, uh, it's not only a result of these things, but it's a result of a lack of understanding of the causes of these things, and so therefore the solutions uh, for these things. <clears throat> now, the situation was a little bit different when religion first emerged. So if you imagine the early humans, right, they would, uh, they would hear thunder in the sky, they would uh, you know, feel the winds, they would uh, feel the rain uh, pouring down on their heads, and they wouldn't really be able to understand what, what was happening, right? But they would still try and explain why these things were happening. And so without any you know, scientific grounding or anything like that, it, they were left basically to resort to explaining the origins of these things as being the result of actions of various gods. Um, <clears throat> and that's what you know, is known basically as animism. Um, inanimate objects or, or natural kind of phenomena are basically uh, thought to have living souls, basically. Um, and that's characteristic of all early forms uh, of religion. Um, and so there is a big difference, actually, between the religion then and the, the religion of today, because actually that was an attempt to explain and understand the world. And um, so it's actually a bit of a grey area, really, if you can even call those uh, kind of early religions religion or idealism. Now, as, uh, as hum humanity progressed uh, and the level of understanding of nature and science increased, you increasingly have uh, the, the basis, basically, for a more rational uh, understanding of, of nature. But the, the rise of class society kind of complicates matters because, on the one hand, it frees up a section of society to be able to think. Uh, and so that uh, allows them, basically, to kind of, in a certain sense, progress humanity's understanding uh, of nature and society. Um, however, these same people who are freed up to do all of the thinking make up the ruling class of society. And these people, their lives kind of revolving around thinking, if you like, divorced from material production uh, themselves, well, it appears to them uh, as if thought alone, basically, is, is responsible for the progress of society. And so this massively strengthens uh, idealist ideas and uh, religious ideas. <clears throat> um, now, I did a quick Google um, the other day, and I found that according to Google, there are 4,000 recognised religions uh, in the world. Not sure who recognises religions, but anyway, uh, I'll, I'll go with that number. So it's, it's obviously an awful lot of religions, right? And uh, I've got 45 minutes uh, to speak, and uh, Sean's a lot bigger than me, so I'm going to try and uh, keep to that, uh, big, that, uh, that length of time. So obviously, I can't focus on all of the religions. Um, and so I think it, in, it'd be best, basically, to focus on one religion um, in order to give comrades a better understanding. And hopefully comrades can come in uh, on others in the discussion. So I'm going to focus my talk, basically, on Christianity. Um, so, yeah, so um, basically Marxism is, uh, if comrades have, 
attended the philosophy uh, talk, uh, Marxism is a materialist philosophy. And so we do, you know, the existence of supernatural entities or things like this uh, is ruled out for Marxists. Um, for Marxists, religion uh, is not uh, something that produces humans. Instead, humans produce uh, religion, and they produce it in their, their own image, essentially. Um, so, for example, uh, Ludwig Feuerbach, who was one of the big uh, influences on uh, Marx and Engels, he once said uh, that uh, if birds had a religion, then the god that they uh, created would have wings. So religions are produced by humanity, we would argue. Um, and so what that means is that they reflect the consciousness uh, of a part of society at a certain time. Uh, and this consciousness, in the last analysis, depends on the character and the health uh, of the mode of production. And so if we are to understand any religion, um, I'd say we have to look at the society in which it emerged. Uh, and when it comes to Christianity, what we're considering here, when it first emerged, was the Roman Empire in its period of decline. Uh, and this was a society that was based on slavery. Um, and slavery is obviously a very extreme form of alienation. Not only, you know, the capitalism, our, the product of our labour is alienated from us, uh, but under slavery, your very body almost is alienated from you. Um, your, your, your body basically is bought and sold by the highest uh, bidder. You know, uh, the, the, the saying, right, that slaves, the only thing that distinguishes a slave from a tool is that it has uh, a voice that can speak. But slavery itself was a quite, almost quite a strange uh, mode of production, um, because whilst slavery as a form of labour became dominant, it was actually uh, less productive than the kind of labour it, it replaced of the free peasantry. And why was that? Well, so when uh, you're working uh, for a boss uh, as a capitalist, or you're working for a capitalist, um, you will do everything that you can to work as little as possible, right? Uh, I had a friend, right, who uh, he used to <laughs> try his best to spend as much time as he physically could going to the toilet, uh, playing video games and things like that, because he would do as little work as possible, basically. Um, and the reason for that is the product of your labour is not yours, right? So you're inclined to do as little uh, as you can get away with. Um, and this phenomenon is multiplied all the more under slavery. Um, so Marx said that the slave is careful to let both beast and tool know that he is a, a different order from them by misusing the beast and damaging the tool. And he further points out that it's uh, a universal principle under slavery that only the rudest and heaviest implements are used. So there's no incentive, basically, under slave uh, under a slave mode of production to introduce labour-saving technology that you see uh, under capitalism. But whilst the, the kind of productivity, I guess, of the individual slave uh, was, was lower, um, the slave could be forced to work a lot harder, um, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> because of the pure brutality of the slave master. So they could produce a greater uh, kind of surplus over the cost of subsistence than the, the free peasant. And so what this meant then was that there was a constant drive in the Roman Empire to, uh, to conquer new territory, basically, in order to find more and more uh, new slaves that could uh, be put to work. Um, <clears throat> now, so slavery basically it brought about a kind of a decline of these small uh, enterprises and the advance of large enterprises. It's a bit similar in that sense to capitalism, but it has the opposite effect as a reduction uh, in, the, in the level of productivity. <clears throat> now, like all social systems, uh, slavery eventually reached its limits and it, uh, it kind of went into a period of decline. And this opened up a period of intense class struggle, had national revolts, uh, civil war. And in a period like this, like it, it, uh, it forces people to think, right? We've been talking about that a lot uh, over this weekend. So people in a situation like this, they begin to question the old ideas, the old morality, the old religion. Uh, and it's out of this ferment that you saw at this time that Christianity actually began to arise. So as you know, Sean pointed out, like ideas, when they arise, they don't do so by accident. They, uh, they do so because they reflect uh, the general outlook of a certain layer uh, of people. 
So in the first centuries of the Roman Empire, um, there were two kind of dominant philosophies at that time, of Epicureanism and Stoicism. Uh, and both of these philosophies, um, appealing to different classes, but they uh, essentially advocated a kind of withdrawal from the physical world. Uh, and you see a similar process uh, whenever a society has exhausted itself, basically. There's a kind of generalized mood of uh, pessimism. Um, you know, there's no, <laughs> there's no need, or seemingly, there's no need for logic or reason when uh, society itself uh, is unreasonable or illogical. Um, and this kind of atmosphere then acts to real, really be a drag on, uh, on human thinking and scientific progress. And so instead, what you tend to see in these sorts of times is the flourishing of kind of inward looking uh, philosophies uh, of mysticism, irrationality uh, flourishes. And that is what we saw uh, in Rome at this time. You know, such, such was the case that even uh, suicide and depression became fashionable. Now, alongside this, when you have society uh, in crisis, it also opens the door for revolution. Uh, and this period was one of countless uprisings, but no class ultimately was able to show the way forward. Um, now, as I said, so the, um, if the growth of slavery means people are kind of thrown off the land, basically, uh, and, uh, and move from the land to the cities. Um, but you have a situation that's different from capitalism. It's based on slave labor. And so these people who are dispossessed of their land possess nothing but their labor power, but are unable really to truly sell uh, their labor power because uh, the value of society is produced in the main by uh, the slaves. And so what you had, you had the formation of a kind of army of basically unemployed people in the cities uh, at this time. And so this was obviously a bit of a problem for the government. And um, we did see the uprisings of these uh, layers of people. Um, and so in order to try and avoid these uprisings, the government would uh, tend or the government would tend to um, give out free food and things like this in order to try and avoid uh, revolution. And so what you have is that unlike under capitalism, you have this proletariat, basically, um, which doesn't produce any of the wealth of society. And it's essentially a kind of parasitic class that actually ultimately lives off the labor of the slaves. Now, there was an immense inequality and depression of uh, the proletariat as well as the, slave, the slaves. Uh, and so that provoked, you know, the, you did have a series of uprisings, but these uprisings of the proletariat never really questioned the kind of existence of private property of humans, uh, if you like. <clears throat> the slaves, on the other hand, were kind of were really too dispersed and too downtrodden to lead a revolution by themselves. And so what would have been required to move society forward at that time would have been a united movement of the proletariat and uh, the slaves. But these two groups had conflicting interests, right? So you have a phenomena of, for example, there's a proletarian movement of Gracchus uh, in 121 uh, BC, but it was crushed with the help of the slaves. Then 50 years later, maybe comrades have heard, of the uprising uh, of Spartacus. Uh, and then in that case, so the uprising of the slaves, and in that case, the proletariat was actually used to crush uh, that uprising. So what you have instead of a revolutionary overturn, you have a long, long period of decline. And, but people still needed some sort of way out of this crisis, right? But a revolution was not possible. And so the way out that was found was a kind of religious one, basically. Um, you know, some kind of bliss or what, heaven or whatever on earth is ruled out. And it's not really a surprise that people would look uh, to some sort of bliss in the afterlife or look to some sort of messiah that could arrive and uh, transform society. And so that's why you get a strengthening uh, of these ideas at that time. And so this kind of social need pushed philosophy, basically, in the direction of uh, Plato's philosophy. Um, and actually, it's quite interesting. The Republic of uh, Comrades of Reddit has a story of uh, someone called Pam Pamphylian. Um, this is a person who'd been killed uh, in a war. But 12 days later, he rises from the dead. He tells of how his soul uh, reached a place where creatures sat in judgment. The just were sent to heaven and the unjust were sent to the bowels of the earth, to hell. Uh, and this was written well before uh, Christianity emerged. So you can see Christianity really was formed in this seething broth uh, of ideas. It picked up on lots of already existing philosophies, basically. Um, 
and it reflected deep social needs that existed. Now, <clears throat> when uh, Christianity first emerged, it was ridiculed, actually, as being a religion of slaves and women. So what does that mean? Well, it was a religion of the most oppressed in society. Um, it began also in a conquered province. You know, so the Roman Empire is uh, constantly trying to seize new territory. One of these areas was a province called Judea. And this is where Christianity first uh, emerged. And really, it was a revolutionary movement at first that was fighting to change the world. Uh, and these people were confident in victory, right? They were, they were so confident, they were willing to embrace martyrdom. They were willing to put their lives uh, on the line, basically, for this. Um, and so you see here, actually, that religion doesn't play the role of uh, quieting uh, the class struggle, really, because these people were fighting for a heaven on earth. Um, <clears throat> and Engels describes the uh, <clears throat> uh, early Christianity. Um, he says, it, uh, it got hold of the masses exactly as modern socialism does under the shape of a variety of sects and still more of conflicting views, but all opposed to the ruling system, to the powers that be. So you have a system in crisis, you have a myriad basically of competing revolutionary sects offering up solutions to this uh, situation. And so, yeah, it's definitely true that these sects had a kind of religious form uh, to them, but that you can't allow just look at that form and make that, you know, obscure the the actual uh, social content, basically. Um, so this was a fighting philosophy um, of the poorest uh, and most oppressed layers. Um, so, for example, the Bible. Uh, um, so the Bible, as we might know it today, right? Uh, what do we hear about it? We hear, uh, you know, turn the other cheek or, uh, or love thy neighbor, things like this. It very much has the character of uh, you know, meekly accepting the status quo uh, and waiting until the afterlife for you, yourself to be rewarded. But it was completely different when Christianity first emerged. It was a re religion of revenge, uh, really, uh, against uh, the Roman oppressors, for example, uh, in the Bible. It talks of the whore of Babylon that needs to be fought against, which is actually, which is Rome, uh, basically. Um, later also, it became uh, a movement uh, against the rich as a whole, um, so you have, uh, for example, in the gospel, according to St. Luke, maybe comrades have heard this, uh, Jesus is made to say, it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, or in the epistle of St. James, it says, go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be witness against you, and you shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the labourers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you, uh, kept back by fraud. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth, and have been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. It's very powerful stuff, right? Um, now, the early uh, Christians, on top of this kind of class hatred, um, they advocated also a form of primitive uh, communism for those who kind of joined uh, the communion. So every member who joined uh, would have to, in the early days at least, renounce all of their uh, possessions. So Jesus, for example, is made to say, um, Who's, whosoever that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Sell that ye have and give alms, give <laughs> donations, give to charity, give everything you have to charity. Later as well, in the fourth century, um, you have this person, St. John, St. John, um, and he, uh, he was basically fighting, I've described this later, he was fighting against the movement of the church away from the early uh, days, and he described the primitive com communism that existed at that time. He said, they gave so willingly that no one remained poor. They did away with inequality and lived in great abundance. And he then asks, why don't we do this again, basically? Um, and he says, if we did it again, um, then we, we would make a heaven on earth. <clears throat> now, there is also a difference, right, between uh, the kind of, uh, this kind of naive primitive communism that the Christians were uh, advocating and the kind of communism that we're uh, fighting for today. 
Um, <clears throat> because, as I said, right, the, so the Roman uh, proletariat lived off uh, charity. And so the, the demands that they made for uh, collective property, um, it didn't really relate to the means of production. What they were advocating was uh, common ownership of the means of consumption, basically. So it doesn't much talk about collectivizing the land, the workshops, the instruments of labor. Um, instead, uh, it limits itself to dividing up the products that are necessary for life. Um, on top of this as well, that you can see there's quite clear limitations. Uh, this couldn't really have been expanded to the whole of society. You know, if all of Roman society was to try and sell their possessions in order to then live off that, well, I mean, who's going to buy <laughs> those possessions, right? Then, even if they manage to sell all of those possessions, who's going to produce the future necessities? You know, if even, even the slaves have been included uh, in the society. So this communism really could only ever exist for a small part of society. <clears throat> um, and so as time went on, basically, you saw Christianity begin to change. Uh, first of all, it was under the impact of continual defeats of these uprisings. You know, the longer that people were made to wait for this uh, Messiah to arrive, well, people less and less began to count on it actually happening. So you have a gradual change from uh, this belief that the kind of you know, kingdom of God will descend from heaven to earth uh, to its opposite, basically. Instead, uh, you know, reward and punishment after death are, are advocated, um, you know, outside this kind of material world, basically. Um, but alongside this, the church itself was uh, beginning to change. So gradually, increasing numbers of, uh, of educated and wealthy people were entering the church as well. You know, society itself was in a complete impasse. So even these layers uh, were totally disgusted at the status quo and moved uh, into the church. Um, and these people brought wealth with them, right, which uh, was beneficial for the church community. It could be spread out and things like this. But it also meant there was a pressure on the church to uh, encourage more and more of these members to join the church. And so water down some of the uh, class uh, struggle rhetoric uh, in, in the Bible and, and things like this. So <clears throat> basically what this meant was that increasingly uh, this communal life that the Christians had been uh, operating under came under increasing pressure because you have the rich who uh, come in. Uh, less and less they're having to give up all of their wealth. They just have to give a small proportion of it. Um, and so increasingly they're separated out from the kind of rest of the community. Um, so you begin to see, you know, the rich, for example, giving charity, but they're eating separately from the poor. The uh, destruction of what, you know, in the early days, the Christians will eat together in common meals and things like this. That began to dis disappear. Um, and so gradually you have the kind of importing, if you like, uh, of the class differences of the wider society into uh, Christianity itself. Um, but that's not <laughs> the fault of Christianity necessarily. Um, what I'd say is that just goes to prove the, the materialist approach, because no matter what fine speeches uh, are made, ultimately, in the end, the economic conditions are decisive. It's impossible to either make laws that are higher um, than the mode of production, and it's also impossible to just separate yourself out <laughs> separately from society and live uh, just how uh, you would please. <clears throat> now, as, uh, there was another element to this that was that as the community grew, um, it became increasing, increasingly necessary to have kind of special members uh, of the society to be able to collect uh, and administer all of these contributions from the members. Um, and so this layer, which was the bishops, uh, began to amass, they would amass increasing amounts of power and also uh, wealth and prestige. Uh, and they, over a long period of time, they began to take more and more uh, kind of responsibilities under their uh, remit. And so gradually within the church, you have this formation of a kind of bureaucratic caste uh, beginning to form. Um, and that's, <laughs> it really, it's, uh, the, the Bishop's individual morality doesn't really come into it. You might have had uh, moral bishops, um, but ultimately their role, the bishop's role, uh, was to get more and more money into the church, it, you know, possibly even just to spread it around um, the, uh, the, the members of the church. And so this had the effect, basically, of making this layer um, represent a kind of opportunistic uh, revisionist uh, tendency within uh, the church. Um, 
<laughs> other bishops may not have been moral uh, at all. And I mean, <laughs> the sort of situation would encourage immoral uh, people or self-interested people uh, to the top, basically. Um, there's a good uh, example in uh, the really excellent uh, Foundations of Christianity um, by uh, Karl Kautsky. Um, he quotes this satire uh, of someone called Peregrinus Proteus um, to illustrate the kind of process. He says that, um, so this satire says, if one who knows how to take advantage of the situation was to come, he would become very rich because he would lead the simple folk around by the nose. So you can see how, you know, with these bishops, the immense power that they had, there was this opportunity basically for them to acquire increasing wealth. It's a funny aside as well. So Kautsky warns, right? He says, this is a satire. Um, so it might misrepresent the situation somewhat. And he says, it's just like uh, the myths about the riches that the agitators of social democracy pile up out of the workers' pennies. Um, and this is very ironic if we consider who Karl Kautsky was, what party he came from. Um, because he came from the German Social Democratic Party, which itself, uh, <laughs> you had a section of it, basically, become a kind of form of labour aristocracy who were increasingly di divorced from the workers' movement because of the uh, you know, higher wages, better living conditions that they were um, uh, experiencing. Um, and also who they came to believe that capitalism was there forever, basically, because of the long boom uh, that was experienced. Um, and Kautsky didn't really do much to oppose uh, this kind of tendency within the Social Democrats. And he also uh, underplays this, uh, you know, this process within the church. Um, but anyway, so what you have is basically between the years of about 100 and 300 AD, there's this gradual crystallization uh, of the bishops as a kind of privileged strata uh, in the church. <clears throat> and now, the Christians still were facing immense uh, persecution. And because of this persecution, there was this uh, desire to kind of uh, unite, basically, to form one uh, church. And so they did. They organized themselves into a kind of single church, basically. Um, and the, the power um, of this united church gave, in turn, uh, the clergy themselves um, a lot more power in society, basically. Um, <clears throat> And so what you had was that eventually this, uh, the clergy themselves, the bishops, became a very powerful force in Roman society. And this was such the case that by uh, the third century uh, AD, in a series of civil wars, and the, the victor, who comes to be the emperor of Rome at that time, was Constantine. Uh, and he was a guy who actually allied himself with the church. So he, you know, <laughs> that was one of the things that led to him becoming uh, emperor. Um, and uh, <clears throat> he kind of uh, made a funny calculation, basically. So he said, or like he thought, um, that, uh, you know, all attempts to kind of crush the Christian movement had failed, right? So what, uh, what alternative do you have? If you can't, uh, if you can't beat something, then why, why not join it? Um, and so what he did, basically, he never, uh, it seemingly he never actually converted to Christianity. But he, seemed, he made a deal, basically. He helped uh, along the corruption uh, of the leaders of the church by absorbing the uh, church into the state, by making it uh, basically an official religion of uh, Rome. So you're going from uh, a religion that's you know, fighting against the whore of Babylon, so to speak, then becomes the state's uh, religion. Um, and this is a common thing, right? Like throughout history, um, the ruling, ruling classes, they've always made up a small proportion in society, right? Or small, uh, yeah, small proportion of society. Uh, and so they, they can't just rule through force alone. They need the power of ideas on the one hand, uh, and also they need to corrupt uh, leaders of the masses as well in order to uh, control, uh, control them. Um, and so, yeah, that's essentially what uh, Constantine uh, did. <coughs> But there was obviously a problem um, because in order to actually utilize Christianity, uh, Constantine had to kind of establish one doctrine because, you know, there was this situation, right, where there's <laughs> millions of different uh, sects, all uh, claiming slightly different uh, kind of interpretations of Christianity. And so he had to assert that one was true. Um, and so he <laughs> made a very good job of it, well, <laughs> quite a good job of it. Um, so 
all Gospels, basically, um, and other writings that gave a different picture of Jesus um, from what Constantine wanted, uh, were rejected as heresy. And there was a huge attempt to just destroy them. Thanks. Um, yeah, and a, a very important part of this was the, the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. This council um, has been really covered up. The existence of this council has been covered up by uh, the church. But it was essentially Constantine drew together uh, loads of bishops from all over uh, the Roman world, but also packed this council full of his own uh, henchmen, if you like. Um, <laughs> some of those who perhaps weren't on uh, Constantine's line were murdered or tortured. Um, and eventually, unsurprisingly, you had uh, this. Well, this was the beginning, basically, of the formation of one single canon uh, of Christianity. Um, yeah, so there was a huge attempt to kind of transform the Christian religion. You had the banning of books. Um, there's about 50 early texts of Christianity that we know uh, were banned, but there would have been plenty more um, from about 392 A.D., um, paganism, which had been the dominant uh, religion of uh, the Roman of Rome, basically in the past, uh, was was banned. You had uh, uh, mobs of fanatical monks sent round to uh, destroy old uh, temples, old statues, uh, to brutally murder uh, philosophers, scientists. It was a real uh, attack on on uh, on reason, on uh, human understanding, basically. And so in place, basically, so the church essentially uh, and Constantine teamed up together to uh, replace uh, reason, essentially, with blind faith. <clears throat> On top of this as well, you had an attempt to, so out of the Gospels that kind of made the cut, if you like, into uh, the Bible, um, there, was a, there was a real attempt to water down um, the class content. But, and so I probably misspoke a little bit earlier, because it was done in a very clumsy way, actually. Um, and that's why you can see some of the early revolutionary spirits still shining through. That's why you still have <laughs> some of those quotes uh, I gave earlier. Um, and that's also the reason why for many years <laughs> people were banned from reading uh, the Bible. It wasn't translated into any language aside from Latin in order to keep it hidden uh, from uh, the general population. And now there's plenty of examples of this watering down uh, of the Bible. I'll just give one uh, for lack of time. Um, and this is the Sermon on the Mount. So in the Gospel, according to St. Luke, Jesus says, uh, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. However, in uh, the Gospel, according to St. Matthew, it's really funny quoting Jesus in uh, this <laughs> uh, setting. But anyway, so the Gospel, according to St. Matthew, uh, was written many decades later. And it said, um, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So you can see here how the class content of this sentence has been basically completely uh, removed. Um, <clears throat> essentially, what you have then is that uh, Christianity, which started uh, as this uh, as this organization of the poorest layers in society, which strove for a, a form of communism, was you know, riddled with this class uh, anger, essentially was hijacked. Um, and eventually then became one of the staunchest supporters of, uh, of despotism. Um, this was, on the one hand, obviously, due to this bureaucratization of the institution. But then this very bureaucratization itself allowed for this layer of the bishops to be used by uh, Constantine. <laughs> you know, it's a good uh, pairing between the two of them. But ultimately, all of this, it's not just a question of individuals, right? It was ultimately a result of the stage of uh, production of Roman society. It wasn't possible to bring in uh, a full communist society at that time. <clears throat> so what you have then is that the church becomes a very a dominant uh, presence in, uh, in society for a, an extended period of time. Uh, and this produces a complete collapse of, of civilization in the whole of the European continent, basically. Uh, for about a thousand years. Um, and so the church is in this dominant position, right? And that means that um, it, it covers all of uh, all human action, right? So that means that for a long period of time, social conflicts that emerge throughout history tend to be fought, fought under a religious uh, banner or in a religious form. Um, and that's aided by these contradictions in the Bible that I, uh, I talked about earlier. Uh, but what this does, right, is that this makes it appear as though these social contradictions that 
uh, kind of bring about these class struggles that we saw, um, they appear to be the result of just, you know, disagreements about what Jesus might have said uh, or meant by what he said. And so what you have then is that you get often these kind of superficial historians who will look at history and almost weep and say like, oh my God, why, why on earth do people just uh, engage in war and destruction and all these, all these things just over the interpretation of a religious text? <clears throat> what they're doing is obviously a very superficial approach because to really understand these conflicts, you need to look below the surface uh, to see the material conditions uh, and forces that underline uh, these conflicts. So an example for, uh, for one is the, the English Revolution, right? So all tendencies really in the English Revolution used the Bible as a kind of backing uh, for what they uh, were doing. Um, but this obviously wasn't just a conflict over biblical uh, interpretations. It was ultimately, in the end, uh, a fight between the rising uh, bourgeoisie and the decrepit feudal uh, regime. Now, this begins to change uh, eventually with the French Revolution, which that revolution was fought under the banner of materialism. Everything in the end had to justify itself by the court uh, of reason. And at first, the revolution attacked the church. But what was the result of this revolution, right? You didn't have the uh, <laughs> bringing about of a society based on liberty, equality, fraternity. You had the rule uh, at the end of the day, of the, the bourgeoisie, again, a minority uh, in society. And when an organisation has been around for a thousand years, I think you probably learn a trick or two, right? So that was, uh, again, the church <laughs> put, on new, put on new clothes, uh, put on its capitalist clothes, um, and <clears throat> linked up again with the, with the new ruling class, basically. And you see this throughout history, right? From, from the days of Constantine through feudalism, uh, and now with capitalism, the clergy have always cozied up uh, to uh, the ruling class of the day. There's basically a fair transaction taking place, right? The, the top layers of the clergy, at least, uh, are fattened up with wealth and privileges and power and things like this. Whilst the ruling class of the day gets uh, some ideological weapons to uh, try and hold uh, the kind of you know, masses in check, basically. Um, and that's why I would say the church has always been on the side of reaction. Um, you know, as I said, there were vicious opponents of the bourgeois revolution until uh, it happened. Uh, the Catholic Church backed Franco, Hitler, uh, Hitler and Mussolini. Um, and the church even cozied up to the Stalinist regime uh, in the end, once it had proved uh, it was no uh, fighter for a socialist society. <clears throat> now, what you also see, actually, though, is that when the labour movement is strong, um, the church often presents itself as a worker-friendly organisation, fighting uh, for truth, justice, all these sorts of things. So Justin Welby, um, who's the Archbishop of Canterbury, basically the head of the Church of England, he recently said that there was no moral case for governments to set budgets that disproportionately affect the poor. He said that the other day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> but the church wouldn't, <laughs> because... They actually have an investment portfolio of about eight billion pounds uh, and they invest in companies like Sports Direct. Do we know much about Sports Direct? This is a company which employ its employment practices are so bad that regularly women have had to give birth in toilets because they're so scared to take time off because they have a strike system whereby if you don't know, take too much time off, you're sacked. So that, that's the contradiction that you see. You know, these people can speak as morally uh, as they want to, but if their wealth and their power is affected, uh, then they very, very swiftly change their tune. So that's why the tops of the churches, at least, would never be on the side of revolution, always be uh, our enemies. <clears throat> now, I would say, though, that the situation is totally different uh, when you look at the, the religious workers or the kind of lower uh, clergy, even, um, because... Now, one thing I would say is in Britain, um, we're in a, um, the, the hold of the church has been weakened uh, quite a lot in recent decades. So according to YouGov, only 27 percent of Britons believe in a God um, and 16 percent uh, believe in the existence of a spiritual higher power. Um, so you can see there is a clear majority for not believing in any kind of higher spiritual power, basically. Um, but we will still, I think, come across many uh, religious people 
uh, workers who want to join the revolutionary movement. Um, and what we must say is that anyone who wants to join uh, the revolutionary movement, the, the fight against capitalism, is welcome to join. It doesn't matter your sex, your uh, gender, your uh, ethnicity, your religion. If you want to fight against this capitalist system, uh, then you're welcome. Now, I have seen it, but often when someone joins a Marxist organisation and they are religious, in time, occasionally, they do uh, start to see some contradiction between their political ideas on the one hand and their religious ideas on the other. That can happen. However, I would say everyone in this room, if we have a, a religious person who joins the organisation, we should not push uh, that question um, at all. Because <clears throat> it is a very person, it's a very sensitive uh, topic, basically. I'd say we should, you know, basically what we should say to religious workers is, well, not only are you welcome uh, to join the fight uh, against capitalism, but you must join the fight against capitalism. Capitalism itself is causing poverty, uh, oppression, war all over the world. And we can, I'm sure, <laughs> agree to fight against these things, right? However, in order for a fight to be successful, we need a program, we need a policy, and we need a perspective. And I'd say this, this can only be provided by Marxism. We can say, right, like once we have socialism, we can see who's correct. The Marxists argue that religion will wither away once we get rid of class society, the oppression, all the things that come with that. Religious people perhaps might say that's not correct. Uh, either it fulfills some deeper social function, whatever, or it's real. Who, who knows um, what, what the reason might be? But let's, why don't we just leave that, right? Like, uh, let's, leave, let's overthrow capitalism, bring about socialism, and we can see uh, who's correct. I think for now, we've got far uh, bigger fish uh, to fry. <clears throat> I would say, though, it is possible to go uh, to accept that <laughs> kind of general position, but then go too far the other way. Because for us, religion is a private affair in relation um, to the state. We'd say that everyone should be free to practice whatever uh, religion um, that they want to. Um, but it's not a private affair, like religion in general is not a private affair in relation to the party. Yes, we say that everyone <coughs> is welcome uh, in the struggle against capitalism, but that can't change the revolutionary program uh, of the party, which is incredible it's fundamental basically in order for us to be successful um so we have to conduct propaganda in favor of this materialist uh, dialectical materialist approach we're also for the complete divorce of the church and the state and um, why should the church have any state funding uh, whatsoever um you know i went to a state school in britain right and every morning we had to sing songs praising god or praising the Christian God. It was all Christian songs uh, that we had to sing. <clears throat> what we'd say is if religious people uh, from their own convictions want to gather together and fund their own churches, that's <laughs> absolutely fine for Marxists. And in fact, we'd go further than that. <laughs> we'd fight against oppression of different religions uh, in, in society. So yeah, Marxism is a materialist uh, revolutionary uh, philosophy and we're a materialist organization. But it's for that very reason, actually, that we don't include things like atheism uh, in our program. Uh, you know, Marx, Engels, uh, Lenin, they all actually fought against anarchists on this question of not including atheism in their program. Because we would say that conditions ultimately are what creates consciousness. You can't just rid society of religion just through propaganda. You know, we're not like uh, people like Richard Dawkins, right, who think, well, luckily, the, the new messiah, uh, Richard Dawkins, has come along, who's uh, happy to teach all of the stupid workers who believe in religion that they're wrong, and that's the way we can get rid uh, of religion. No, that's, that's completely wrong. This, people like him want to get rid of religion without uh, getting rid of the actual causes, the material causes uh, of religion. But more than this, we would say that actual, the actual participation in the class struggle itself develops consciousness. Like Lenin gave the example of a strike. So what happens in a strike? Well, hopefully all layers of the workers in a particular uh, company or whatever are, are included. And that includes religious and non-religious uh, workers. And if at this time you were to preach atheism, put that as a condition for joining the strike, well, you'd just be playing into the hands of the bourgeoisie. What does the bourgeoisie try and do? They emphasize all differences apart from class differences in order to defeat 
uh, movements. Again, on top of this, though, we have to say that consciousness uh, changes rapidly under the influence of events. You can look at uh, an example, right? In the 1905 revolution, you had a procession of workers, of religious workers, who are holding uh, religious iconography, things like this. Um, and the Bolsheviks tried to uh, intervene in this uh, demonstration, were beaten up uh, by these workers. But within 24 hours, under the impact of the repression that that movement faced by uh, the Tsar, within 24 hours, this, these <laughs> religious workers were demanding weapons uh, from the Bolsheviks. <clears throat> now, thanks. Um, yeah, so basically what we need to do, I would say, is find a balance, <laughs> essentially, uh, between, on the one hand, this kind of uh, anarchistic uh, approach, and on the other hand, the kind of opportunist approach. We want to avoid uh, kind of anarchism, <laughs> like pokes religious people uh, in the eye and kind of pushes them out just at the crucial moment. It reminds me of what Trotsky said about anarchism, of being uh, an umbrella with holes in it, <laughs> useless just when uh, you need it. Um, but we also, on the other hand, need to avoid a, a kind of opportunist uh, approach, which just reconciles itself to the belief in, uh, in God forever. Um, and so therefore refuses to struggle against it. You know, it's, these people are not guided really by the class struggle. They're just guided by, oh, you must not offend anyone. Um, <clears throat> so what we need to do, I think, in every uh, circumstance, basically, is make a judgment. So what in this particular scenario aids the movement, the real movement of the working class. So that's our task, right? It's to, it's to unite the working class everywhere uh, in struggle against this rotten system. We want and we are fighting for a communist society, but it's a communist society on a, on a higher level uh, than the, the kind of uh, you know, naive communist societies that these uh, early Christian uh, martyrs were fighting for. And um, it would be a society that would... Uh, be based on this immense development of the productive forces that capitalism has brought uh, about. It would be a society uh, which Trotsky once described. He said, under socialism, solidarity will be the basis of society. All the emotions which we revolutionists at the present time feel apprehensive of naming, so much have they been worn thin by hypocrites and vulgarians, such as disinterested friendship, love for one's neighbour, sympathy, these will be the mighty ringing chords of socialist poetry. Uh, a society like this, you know, where people's actual needs are cared for rather than uh, you know, cast aside the interests uh, of profit. This would create the conditions for humanity to rise to new heights that we've never uh, seen before. Rather than just waiting until we're dead, <laughs> you know, pie in the sky as the, as the song uh, goes. Instead, we would have brought about a society where I would say there would be no need uh, for religion. And that's what we're fighting for, for a real uh, heaven on earth. Thank you.